Hi. Hi. I think we'll get started. Um, welcome. My name is Christina Weil, and I'm the co-founder and co-president of uh, the Association of Print Scholars. This is Brittany Salisbury, who is also co-founder and co-president. Um, and we are just delighted to see um, such a large uh, response to um, this event. Um, I hope to book Madison Square Garden, but um, the Pope beat us to it. Uh, and we're really glad that you all managed the difficult travel situation. So many of you in the audience may already be familiar with uh, the Association of Print Scholars. Um, APS launched almost a year ago in October 2014. Um, and we are a nonprofit professional organization dedicated to um, supporting innovative scholarship about printmaking and um, facilitating dialogue among our members. And as of today, we have over 350, 370 members um, who come from all over the world and represent a range of professional um, careers. We have curators, academics, grad students, paper conservators, artists, um, and print dealers. So it's a very exciting, um, diverse group. Um, so in addition, in addition to hosting public events like this, we also um, have our website, www.printscholars.org, and it's now a resource for people in the print community. Um, it's a place where members can post about recent news, opportunities, and events uh, that may be going on in, in um, their world. Uh, earlier this month, we awarded the first annual uh, Shulman and Bullard uh, article prize for the best article by an early career scholar. Um, it's a $2,000 prize, and we're really um, very pleased to, to be able to give that now every year. And uh, last year, we organized member events for our, our members in Paris, Berlin, and So we invite you to join APS or just simply attend any of our next uh, events. Um, on November 7th, we're hosting a major uh, symposium at Hunter College. It's an all-day symposium uh, with speakers uh, ranging from graduate students all the way up to uh, very established members of the, of the print community. And then in February, uh, we are also supporting, um, sponsoring a panel discussion at the College Art Association's annual meeting uh, in Washington, D.C. So we also, before we get started, just need to thank a few people. Um, we could not have done this without the support of the International Fine Print Dealers Association and the Art History Department here at the Graduate Center. And particularly, we'd like to thank Michelle Senecal at the IFPDA, and, um, and Claire Bishop and Andrea Appel at the GC, and several APS officers who've done a lot behind the scenes to make sure that the RSVPs have gone well and that the event was um, running smoothly. So Allison Chang and, and Catherine Alkauskas helped us with that. Um, so we're having a reception after uh, the, the lecture. It'll be upstairs on the third floor in the art history department. Uh, when we're all finished here, you can all matriculate over to the elevators, and there'll be signs directing you uh, from there to where the reception is being held. So now I'm going to turn it over to Brittany, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Christina. Um, so my name is Brittany Salisbury, and like Christina, I just wanted to thank everyone for um, trekking out in Midtown at its worst to, to be here today. And I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Peter Parshall. Um, he probably requires very little in the way of introduction, since um, even those of you who don't imagine yourself to be print scholars have probably read his work. Peter served as the curator of Old Master Prints at the National Gallery of Art in Washington for over a decade before retiring in 2010. Prior to his time there, he served as the Jane Newberger Goodsell Professor of Art History and the Humanities at Reed College, beginning in 1971. He completed his PhD in art history um, on Lucas Van Leiden at the University of Chicago and as a fellow at the War Warburg Institute in London. His extensive list of, of scholarship includes the 1994 book of the Renaissance print with David Landau and the exhibitions The Unfinished Print of 2001 and The Darker Side of Light, Arts of Privacy, 1850 to 1900 of 2009 to 2010. He is currently researching the curator William Ivins for the Metropolitan Museum of Art's 2016 exhibition, The Power of Prints, The Legacy of William Ivins and Hyatt Mayer. Peter's incredibly substantive body of scholarship in itself would have made him the perfect fit for APS's inaugural lecture. But what made us think of him immediately is the way in which he has done so much to encourage new ways of thinking about printmaking. 
Peter has produced scholarship that has required reading not only for his own subfield of old master prints, but for scholars of 19th century art and everything in between. When organizing this lecture, we had a vague notion that we hoped it could deal with a broad, innovative topic that would prompt people to think about print scholarship and the state of the field as a whole. We couldn't have been happier with the, the lecture topic that Peter proposed, Why Study Prints Now? Please join me in welcoming Peter Parshall. Um, well, when I first received this invitation, uh, I imagined myself putting together, as I indeed went ahead to do, a kind of wonky lecture for print junkies. Um, uh, but then as things progressed and the time drew nigh, uh, I started receiving telephone calls from friends in Georgia and California and Germany and so on, uh, regretting the fact that they weren't going to be able to, to come to New York. And I thought, well, hmm, the audience is getting bigger and bigger, not the real audience, but the potential audience, which is a, a kind of remarkable testimony to the organizers of the event, who I think maybe should give this up and go into advertisement instead. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, the lecture as it came out was a kind of a, a meander, a reflection on various things that seemed to me to be interesting and important about the history of this field. Um, and it takes a, a number of turns. Uh, I think it contradicts itself at least once, maybe twice, um, and comes out someplace. Uh, uh, and we can talk about that in the question period. But I, I uh, thank you very much, given that uh, it is a magnificent day outside, you know, Pope, one way or the other. Um, and you have chosen to come in here in the dark. So my appreciation for that. Many years ago, I was sitting in an audience like this one when an esteemed colleague rose and addressed us collectively as those who love prints and other works on paper. I remember being a little disconcerted at the time by this association, not because I don't, in some personal respect, have an affection for prints and even a love for certain of them, being that they have been the subject of a good deal of my professional attention over the last half a century. But even that is not enough to presume the presence of an emotion such as love even allowing for its debasement in informal conversation. The remarkable thing about this frequently declared passion is that it was acknowledged well over 300 years ago as something particular to those with an interest in prints. I refer here to the well-known and infamous satire of, print, of the print collector given by the French writer Jean de la Bruyère in his Caractère, composed in 1688. The passage describes a private collector's obsession with the etchings of Jacques Callot. Quote, will you look at my prints, asks Democed, and in a moment he brings them out. You see one among them neither well printed nor well engraved and badly drawn, more fit to be stuck against the wall of some house. He assures you he has the only one in all of France for which he paid very a very heavy price and would not part with it for the best print to be found anywhere. I labor under a serious affliction, he declares, which will one day cause me to give up collecting prints. I have all of Callot's etchings except one, which to tell the truth, so far from being the best, is the worst he ever did, but which would complete my holdings. I have hunted for this print for these 20 years, and now I despair of ever getting it." Unquote. 1688. Parody aside, uh, there's, there has been a long and extraordinary sense of identification with the medium of prints among those who study and collect them. This may, be, this may be partly a defensive reaction to a prejudice against the replicated image being a minor art, but this is a matter of being historically uninformed. It is failing to understand that throughout the Renaissance, a print being as it was a finished and marketable object, was likely to be more highly valued than a drawing. And although that order of priority has changed in the eyes of many, even today the cost of a rare print will often exceed that of a comparable drawing. I've recently experienced the potency of this attachment to works on paper 
in response to an essay I wrote for the newsletter of the Print Council of America. There, I addressed the current responsibilities of print curators and whether we were being unduly concerned about our future. The essay raised a question about the long-term importance of maintaining staffs of specialists assigned to care for an individual artistic medium rather than, say, an historical period. Not surprisingly, it touched a nerve. I shall return to this matter later on, but it's best to warn you that my remarks are meant as a caution about what it means in 2015 to be structuring an art history and an appreciation of objects according to the medium in which they are realized. It would be perfectly reasonable to dismiss this question as pedantically academic or touchingly sentimental, were it not for the fact that prints in particular inspire such curiously intense allegiance. However, in reflecting on this history from our current perspective, we need to take into account an important factor that I, for one, will not claim to understand with uh, any degree of subtlety. That is the so-called digital revolution. It's a commonplace to say that we approach the past through the mentality of our own time, and after all, why should it be any other way? But the case of printmaking at present is significantly overdetermined. The much acclaimed reinvention of printmaking, now 600 years behind us, has supposedly given way to a digital world that portends the imminent displacement of the printed text and by extension also the printed image. Whether or not we consider either event to be a revolution, this is the rhetoric being employed. My point is not to comment on the truth of either, but only to underscore the fact that it places a heavy weight on understanding these events. Historians such as ourselves, whether we be revolutionists or evolutionists, have something at stake in the discussion. Thus, it is useful to consider how our thinking about the history of printing, and more specifically printmaking, has evolved. Overall, it seems fair to say that the impact of printing in Europe and the Americas has been retrospectively seen to be positive. A more effective means of communication across a wider spectrum of the population has been seen to benefit the majority in the long run. It has been a force for liberation and free expression and an aid to populist movements. It has provoked censorship, but then contrived the means to overcome it. On the negative side, we have, among much else, the encouragement to public slander, the invention of new forms of state propaganda, and the sensationalist press. The list, pro and con, is now being mirrored in a very similar way in the discussion of the so-called social media, a topic I sp spend more time trying not to think about than thinking about. There, too, the current assessment seems on balance positive, although plenty of concerns have been raised, not least about the, the, uh, inter, um, about the Internet. The anesthetization of the population, a so-called global community being orchestrated by invisible powers that have yet to deliver the bill. All this has to some degree been worried about before, although certainly not in comparable circumstances or in comparable terms. The European Renaissance, in one of its famously self-congratulatory moments, proclaimed that the, that the printing press to be among the three great achievements of modern civilization. In this pantheon of discoveries, printing sat alongside gunpowder and the magnetic compass. No one yet fully understood that all three had been developed in China many centuries before. But in European hands, these inventions became, in their respective ways, all means for the extraordinary exercise of power. Given what followed as a result of the voyages of discovery, the claim made for their importance was hardly an idle boast. Consequences aside, for the moment, how did it all get started? The manufacture of paper had been practiced in the West for at least two centuries before it became widespread. But papermaking only appeared in, the, in Germany at the close of the 14th century, shortly before the earliest known woodcuts showed up in Central Europe. 
Literacy seems to have risen gradually throughout this period, but did not spike at any point. Likewise, the demand for books gradually increased, probably encouraged by monastic reforms, but neither in itself seems to have caused a major effort towards mechanical reproduction. After all, building, after all, building a simple printing press required no more than available skills and materials once its purpose was made clear. And anyhow, the makers of the earliest woodcuts didn't need them. Although a sufficiently refined means of making metal type was a considerable achievement, the basic casting techniques were known. Whatever finally provoked the development of a means of printing, it is a tangled chicken and egg problem. But then what was a print in the 15th century anyway? The woodcut you now see on the screen is not among the first of its kind, but a generation or two after the earliest European examples we know. Much smaller than an average business card, it's hardly prepossessing as an object. But then it is also not just a knockoff postage stamp of a saint to pin on your hat. This is, of course, St. Veronica displaying her veil with the imprint of the face of Christ on it, one of the many stories surrounding the passion and the supposed origin of, of several much venerated miracle-working icons. I won't go into the details here, but f suffice it to say, the dark silhouette of the holy face references a specific line within a tradition of images of the face of Christ, and probably a specific relic something that may or may not have been known to our woodcut's first possessor. Its exceptionalness may explain the abrasions on the surface that probably indicate touching and perhaps also kissing. The simple outline of the woodblock printed on vellum, the, the, the more costly substance, not paper, underlies the addition of paint, gold leaf, and silver leaf. In short, it reveals rather little of its initial manufacture. It is a very special, quite obviously unique object. Whoever it was that first acquired it probably pasted the image into the cover of a prayer book to give it a suitable context, protection, and ready access. Its erratic power, we cannot know, but surely it was there despite its distance from the holy image it now evokes. To what extent does calling this a print tell us anything about its individual and, and cultural history? Although Veronica is an extreme case, it does make a point about the value of a multiplied object. The fact of its multiplicity may have nothing to do with how it is regarded by a respondent who, after all, possesses a thing that is unique. In other cases, it may be of importance to know that owning something, uh, one is, uh, that one is a participant in a community of sorts whose members are largely unknown to one another, but nonetheless able to feel a kind of fellowship. In short, the fact of being multiple affects the value of the thing by choice, not by ontology. In the beginning, prints were likely never considered as multiples in the way we think of them now. Let us look briefly at some points along the road in the historiography of printmaking. This story goes back a long way, acquiring its first significant landmark in 1662 with John Evelyn's remarkable and insufficiently known treatise, Sculptura, or the History and the Art of Chalcography. Best known as a diarist reporting on the mundane activities of his class, Evelyn was in fact a polymath and a founding member of the Royal Society in London. He wrote about air pollution, forest trees, numismatics, horticulture, and much else, including this lengthy treatise on, the, uh, on engraving undertaken as part of the Royal Society's planned history of the mechanical trades. Evelyn's treatise is notable for being the first concerted attempt to provide a comprehensive history of a single artistic medium. And I do mean comprehensive, for he genuinely sought to provide an account of the history of engraving in the broadest possible sense, from prehistory to his own time 
and global. There is, an, uh, there, there is even a section on antediluvian times. Engraving begins with incision and relief. Thus, ancient inscriptions, as well as, Egyp as Egyptian and New World hieroglyphs, and the finger of God inscribing the tablets of the law, a weighty precedent indeed. Evelyn rooted around furiously in Lexica and Thessauri through classical and rabbinical and early Christian texts, inferring dubious etymologies and improbable terminology in order to explain the origins of tools and techniques. Although mainly an encyclopedic concoction of erudite pedantries, it is nonetheless surprising that he knew, for example, about Chinese and Indian practices and their antiquity. He also had a substantial collection of several thousand prints of his own and held strong opinions about artists and techniques. The Karachi are great, but Rembrandt is too gloomy and depressing. He writes about the larger cultural and societal ramifications of the print medium, its effectiveness in educating the young, and in transmitting knowledge about the appearance of things, its service to antiquarians and the new science, its capacity for conveying visual records, and so on. Evelyn, however, does not regard the invention of printing as a revolution, either in technology or in thought. On the contrary, it was by his lights the result of a glacial development traceable to the very fog bank of prehistory. Yet Evelyn was in interested only in what he called engraving, the more prestigious of, the, of printmaking techniques, even though the earliest works he knew were woodcuts, a medium that receives almost no attention at all. It would be a century before something comparable was done for that medium. In 1766, Jean-Michel Papillon, a French designer and block cutter, published a three-volume work on the history and technique of woodcut. The lineaments of modern print scholarship, freed from mythology, merge in a pronounced way only during the mid to late 18th century. The ground rules for what constituted proper historical study had long been debated, and the relative importance of material and textual evidence reconsidered. In, in the 1770s, Edward Gibbon completed The Decline and Fall of Rome, and Denis Diderot's richly illustrated encyclopedia was moving to its unstable completion under heavy opposition for its progressive views. For uncovering the early history of printmaking, which meant investigating the origins of the woodcut, we must turn to Karl Heinrich von Heineken, a student of literature and law, and later secretary and librarian to Graf Heinrich von Brühl, a powerful figure in the Prussian court and a collector of exhibitable knowledge. Among his duties, Heineken was charged with accumulating a collection of art and natural history, including a substantial print collection that was, his, in, in fact, his special expertise. In 1746, he was appointed head of the Dresden Kupferstück Cabinet, a separately founded civic institution dedicated exclusively to prints. In 1771, he published his volume in French titled A General Idea for a Complete Collection of Prints, which includes a history of the medium. Like Evelyn, Heineken was essentially an antiquarian preoccupied with the, origin, the origins of printmaking. But his ambitions were more modest. They involved practical matters chiefly when and how printmaking got going, and who was the first to print books. It was generally agreed that rag paper was the key to the origin of the technique, but there was very little information available on the subject. It was, however, assumed that the earliest prints to be made were woodcut playing cards, and that the demand for these frivolous attractions lay behind the whole enterprise. As to concrete evidence, it was Heineken who identified the famous uh, St. Christopher, then in the Buxheim Monastery near uh, library near Lake Constance. This discovery met with much acclaim, especially in Germany, anxious to defend its priority as the inventor of printmaking itself, printing itself. When the book was later sold off to an English uh, aristocrat, it was uh, deemed a theft of, na of a national treasure. But then two generations later, 
Heineken cla Heineken's claim for the priority of the woodcut was vigorously challenged and is now agreed to have been created at least a generation later than it was previously thought. As you must be beginning to notice, this entire story has a certain geekiness to it that makes it all the more lovable. In this case, however, the geeks have not prevailed, for despite a century of well-grounded doubt, the Buxheim St. Christopher can still be found all over the web, touted as the first dated print. It is a good example of the tenacity of misinformation once printed. At the same time, one must also be aware that due to its very nature, printing is the best documented medium of communication in early modern history. And therefore, its prominence in our thinking is guaranteed. But that self-fulfilling prophecy does not make its actual impact proportionate to all that we seem to know about it. Like us, the 18th century was an era in quest of technical firsts. And in regard to printing with movable type, the uncontested blockbuster in the history of the press, the lines were drawn between Gutenberg of Germany, Lawrence Koster of the Netherlands, and sometimes even William Caxton for being the first to print books. This dispute had been going on for centuries as a matter of national pride. The case for the Harlemer Lawrence Koster seems to have been based on Netherlandish block books and the idea that 20 years before Gutenberg, he adapted the block book format by cutting out the, the wooden letters and then arranging them as movable type. In 1775, Gottfried von Moore, the editor of the first journal of art history, confidently de declared that Heineken's researches had, quote, served excellently to gag the mouth of those defenders of the mythical Lawrence Koster, unquote. Nonetheless, I've been told by more than one Hollander, they were taught in school that Koster was actually the first to use movable type. There was also some discussion of the invention of printing involving a conspiracy with the devil. This centered on Gutenberg's collaborator, Johann Fust, named John Faustus by English writers and thus inevitably identified with the historical Dr. Faustus, a mag magician and alchemist who trafficked with the underworld, and so it went. The 19th century saw a virtual avalanche of books on the history of printing and printmaking, much of it repetitious, but all of it testimony to the avidity with which the topic drew attention. That said, despite its sectarian spats and love of self-mythologizing, the 18th century investigation of the origins of printmaking was in many respects a model of historical rigor. It made refined use of stylistic and philological evidence, library and archival research, antiquarian studies and technical examination, all employed to good effect. It was a contextualized interpretation of a new technology and to some degree a model history of scientific innovation. And then, in the midst of it all, there came Adam Barch, steadily nurturing the, nurturing the gigantic mouse that would eventually consume the field of print studies. The Peintre Gravure, 21 volumes issued in less than 20 years, that most astonishing of all accomplishments in the history of cataloging. It is a document yet to be fully surpassed and still the most extensive compilation to be found anywhere in the history of any medium all of it done by hand without the help of photography and needless to say without a computer. The Pantragravure catalogs with notorious inconsistency what Barch regarded as original quote unquote prints from the 15th through the 17th century. Following in the wake of the dealer and collector Pierre-Jean Mariette and greatly dependent on his efforts, Barch organized the basic map of European print production completing the corpus in 1821, at which point he retired permanently from the planet, legacy intact. <laughs> Barch determined how prints would henceforth be classified and organized in most public collections, and for this Herculean accomplishment, he is rightly regarded as a hero to our profession. In practice, however, Barch's catalog is a well-scaffolded finder's aid 
and in due course it would flatten the landscape of print studies for more than a hundred years, rendering it largely fallow as a field of social and cultural investigation. Although we could probably all think of exceptions, a cursory survey of print scholarship from the 1850s to the 1950s would tend to confirm the following profile. A marked shift from museum print collections ordered by topic to collections of masterpieces ordered, uh, ordered by the art historical canon. A list of exhibitions, dissertations, books, and articles inclined to the study of individual techniques and monographic surveys dedicated to specific artists and schools. Add to this an intense concentration on the narrower aspects of print connoisseurship, discovering new states, chronicling plates and block deterioration, debating the aesthetics of the ideal impression. In other words, problems of a largely centrifugal nature so far as the historical study of the medium is concerned. The study and exhibition of prints, the most widely diverse and broadly interconnected of the many pictorial arts, became more self-interested. Likewise, the market and its clientele, private collectors and museums themselves, came to be driven largely by the pursuit of masterpieces, and especially of rarities, in a field defined primarily by its capacity to multiply images with a maximum of uniformity. The quest for particular states, unrecorded if possible, the preference for wide margins and proof impressions among old masters, and other anachronistic traces of the art of production came to lead the market for intaglio prints. Barch, who was typically vilified for his murky distinction between original and reproductive prints, might better be questioned for helping encourage rarity as a defining aesthetic category, and more worryingly, turning print curators into filing clerks. In many respects, all of this was a good thing, it salvaged oddities and helped reconstruct micro-histories that would otherwise have gone unattended. And indeed, Barch was only recording what the market had already begun to seek out on its own. As dealers in drawings, um, yeah, sorry about the one on the left. Um, anyway, can't be done. Um, as dealers in drawings, the Mariette certainly understood the value of rarity and by the late 18th century, publishers were issuing impressions avant la lettre with little treats in the margin in order to boost profits. And I'm referring here to the little remark, as it's called in the lower right-hand corner of the print on the left, um, which is a, a, a lovely little landscape that was left there for people who had special access, access to very early impressions before it was taken away. And what you see on the right was added along with a lot of additional work on the plate. So these are, these are, we might say, contrivance very much of the market. Nevertheless, Barch's help me, the peintre gravure taken as a model, amounts to a narrow kind of art history, cleaving to the satisfactions of current taste and curiosity more than mainstream cultural history, that arena in which print studies had once been a pioneer. La Bruyere's hysterical character, caricature of Democed had come back to haunt us, and in many respects, it was Josef Adam Ritter von Barsch who built that stage for its revival. Of course, it is neither easy nor comfortable to recognize ourselves in this picture, and there are a good many reasons for that. I would like now to look quickly at three cases the more recent, in the more recent historiography of print studies, when it regained its greater dimension as a field. Let us begin in 1936, when the philosopher and literary critic Walter Benjamin, then living in exile in Paris, published the first version of the essay that would eventually make him a household name among print people. I mean, of course, the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction which first appeared in French in the Zeitschrift für Sozialforschung under the, the editorship of Max Horkheimer at the Institute for Social Research, later known as the Frankfurt School, and now I believe later relocated down the block. Not being readily available in this country, means essay did not enter the discussion of prints until after it appeared in English translation in 1969. 
Nonetheless, it has interest for us as a culminating point in the historiography of the printed image. There is not time here to discuss the substance of Benjamin's complex thesis, but only to make two points about it. The first is to recognize that Benjamin saw profound social and political implication in the mechanically reproduced image, which he associated with an anti-elite form of communication, and thus a challenge to the established cultic literary and artistic canons. But more important, at the moment he was writing, he saw the mechanically reproduced image as being available for co-option by the disenfranchised. He saw it as a potential means of subversion within the fascist state. Far from understanding the replicated media as constituting an independent category of creative expression with its own internal imperatives, he understood its historical significance as, uh, as thoroughly embedded in society and politics. And in his own tortured moment, it was a possible means of creating a sense of common purpose and common identity among the powerless. It bore the potential for revolution. The second point I want to make regarding Benjamin's thesis is merely a clarification. Contrary to the way in which the essay is usually read by historians of prints, Benjamin's primary example of replicated imagery is film, not the conventional printed images as such. Benjamin was invoking the notion of an art for the masses, Massenkunst in German, and something of a buzzword in the, in the 1920s. The mass media, promoted and feared by cultural commentators on the left and the right, became a force to reckon with, principally as a result of the perceived effect of printed propaganda during the First World War. Not quite simultaneously, strongly opposite, in 1939, the Partisan Review published Clement Greenberg's now classic essay, Avant-Garde and Kitsch. At this stage of his career, like many other leftist intellectuals confronting the reality of Stalinism, Greenberg began to modify his socialist convictions in line with Trotsky and the emerging neoconservative views that would gradually come to dominate the review in the 1950s. In any event, Avant-Garde and Kitsch Greenberg's first major piece of published criticism appeared more or less at the center of that arc. It was during the brief and politically charged years of 1939 and 1940 that the essence of his legacy can begin to be identified. In these years, Greenberg's political feet remained firmly on the left, and like Benjamin, he was a fervent and outspoken anti-capitalist. Greenberg's major contribution to modernist art theory for our present purpose can be summarized in the briefest possible terms as follows. The defense of an elite culture against the corruption of popular taste and the axiom that an artistic medium should be pursued and evaluated according to the dictates of its own structural imperatives. Most famously, the proposition that painting needed to acknowledge the flatness of its surface and the restrictions of the frame. These two premises, the maintenance of the free practice of high art and the pursuit of the integrity to medium, served perfectly as justifications for abstraction, Greenberg's main cause as a critic and defender of American modernism. Both principles also served as an argument for a disinterested aesthetics that divorced art from politics, which is to say, all content external to itself. This presents us an odd picture, as if suddenly Greenberg, performing as Kant, were to walk into the room wearing Marx's great coat and sporting a massive white beard to announce that the eventual, the eventual triumph of socialism was at hand, but for the sake of its own survival, the fine arts should keep to themselves. The story of the depoliticization of post-war American modernism has been debated often and cannot be rehearsed here. Suffice it to say that a choice was on offer regarding how art should be approached and interpreted in both scholarly and public settings. It is certainly the case that Greenberg, like Benjamin, thought about art in its socio-political setting, even as they came to radically different conclusions. 
In the end, Greenberg seemed to be a kind of isolationist who saw the fragility of high culture and sought its protection rather than enlisting its influence. He encouraged a retreat into self-containment, and in doing so, he also provided a theoretical undergirding for the separation of curatorial responsibilities. Our current division by medium is not Greenberg's doing, but it can claim his ideas as theoretical support even so. As far as I am aware, even though, as far as I am aware, he never wrote a word about a print. I'm sure he did someplace, but I can't find it. Retrospectively, studies of the media from the mid to late 20th century bore a lot of intellectual weight. They took on the popular press, political caricature, advertisement, technical illustration, and even ephemera, making a good case for having laid the groundwork for what we now refer to as visual culture, along with its European counterpart, Bildwissenschaft. Print studies were once again actively stirring up the historical landscape. Instrumental to this development in our country was, of course, William Ivins, the first curator of the print department at the Met in the days when it was still called a print department. However much we might disagree with various of Ivan's often provocative observations, there is, there is no doubt that it was he who, who made the subject intellectually gripping, at least for those of us who have worked seriously on prints over the last several decades. In many ways, he is our local hero. Ivan's best known proposition arose out of his interest in scientific and technological progress. By any measure, an overwhelming factor in America's self-image between and after the two world wars when Ivan's was writing. He made accessible the argument that having the same image of the same object or device simultaneously in the hands of many people in different places was essential to technological advance. That simple proposition, ultimately descending from John Evelyn and Ivan's concept of pictorial syntax, together anticipated by a decade Marshall McLuhan's famous dictum, the medium is the message. Ivan's book, Prints and Visual Communication, also had an influence on the emergence of information theory, somewhat of a vogue before and after the advent of private, com of private computers. Ivan's was interested in replication as knowledge. The second important proposition that emerged with particular force in the 70s and 80s was a claim for the agency of the early press in the propagation of social and religious movements. I refer to the origins of pictorial propaganda and popular teaching during the decisive years of the early Reformation and the Peasants' War in Northern Europe, a case made most forcefully by Marxist scholars led by the Australian historian Robert Scribner, along with um, certain writers in the former German Democratic Republic. Their arguments had precedent in the work done uh, by European scholars on newsprint and printed propaganda after World War I. So we're seeing continuities running through this story. The most sweeping thesis to be put forward in recent years regarding the impact of, of the printed image on Western culture is Christopher Wood's book, Forgery, Replica, and Fiction, published in 2008. It is an assessment of the printed image and its impact on our conception of historical time and space addressing the various ways in which material evidence of the past was portrayed and understood prior to the establishment of precise historical chronologies. In this pre-Renaissance state of affairs, ancient monuments were invoked by mere approximations of an imagined type, a scheme Wood calls substitutability. Then, with the proliferation of images through printing, a kind of verification came into play where printed images sought to portray, portray the physical singularity of things, thereby making possible a new understanding of history as a coherent sequence of material events by identifiable points in a chain, in effect, a modern conception of history. This objectification of the past, consistent with an emerging secular worldview, demystified the object by making it familiar and thus mundane. In this thesis, we can see strains of Benjamin's notion of the loss of aura 
and also Ivan's thinking about what he called the exactly repeatable pictorial statement. Wood's thesis grants extraordinary power to the printed image in bringing about a shift in cultural mentalities, at least so far as the perception of historical time is concerned. Yet he also introduces a kind of deconstruction of this vector in the activities of artists who make a subjective claim to their own intellectual property. Signing a replicated image makes it individual and thus dissolves the objectivity that had putatively been gained by disseminating information as verifiable fact. Two different in intentions, two different results. But are they in fact contradictory? One might respond by saying that in both categories, the reproduced image implies the validation of a witness whose evidence is made subject to disproval in the first case and to dis, uh, disapproval in the second. That is to say, we can make our judgment about the qualities of a work of art on our own, whereas in the first, the, the image provides evidence uh, which can then be weighed in the balance. So where are we? So much for background. I'll now get myself into more serious trouble by returning to my exchange with the print council. For this, I apologize to my fellow members who may be in the audience, uh, as indeed they are. Uh, what comes next is primarily addressed to curators, but the implications, I hope, are relevant to all. I hear the locution, I am a print person, often, but I never hear, I am a paintings person. Why is that? What I often said to my interns was that they should think of themselves not as committed to works of art made in a particular medium, but rather as art historians with an interest in such things. Although one can say the distinction is purely rhetorical, there is nevertheless an attitude underlying the emphasis on medium, one that I believe tends to be limiting rather than inclusive. Another thing I've noticed is an inclination not only among students but also among curators in other fields to believe that there is something inherently mysterious about dealing with prints, an intimation that they have not been, been let in on the handshake. I've been approached on a few occasions by recent graduates seeking a museum career who felt that they, quote, didn't understand prints and wanted to learn more about a field that they openly regarded as obscure. Again, would one expect to hear such a confession about paintings, whether true or not? I think we have been a little guilty of encouraging this perception, or at least not actively discouraging it. When I entered the field of art history as a graduate student, works on paper were something that one, looked, one took an interest in, mainly in order to find out something else. What Raphael used for source material, how, de how designs got transmitted across the Alps, how po popular a particular saint's cult might have been, why Degas cropped his compositions the way he did. Almost nobody wrote dissertations on prints, not least because so much of what had, what had been written about them was restricted to catalogues resume and sections of monographs focused on more important subjects. Now the situation is very different. There are dissertations aplenty, as well as exhibitions exploring all manner of historical, social, cultural, economic, and political topics through works on paper, along with monographic and thematic installations of the familiar sort. And the insertion of works on paper into displays of other kinds of objects has become in common practice in museums, despite the conservational difficulties with additional and the additional labor involved. The difference is that in a variety of ways, works on paper have been steadily integrated into the larger history of art. However historicized the works we have been considering from the 1930s and, and 1960s, that kind of integration was actually not happening. However obvious this may seem, it is a development that is crucially important for how curators understand their role in museums and in the academy. Prints have found their way into every corner of the pictorial and plastic arts and can be understood as one binding medium in the history of Western art from the early modern period to the present. And meanwhile, in the larger world of postmodern artistic production, 
discrimination by medium has become nearly incidental. Witness the materials line on a wall label for a Robert Rauschenberg combine. Making the history of prints a part of the history of post-medieval art in general has been the task of the last generation. The founding of an organization such as this, one that defines itself according to the boundaries of a medium, must reflect with special care on the assumptions that underlie this way of parsing cultural history. One must, at, one must ask oneself why no such organization exists for painting and sculpture, although comparable ones do exist for the history of the book and the history of film. In short, those domains that have no history of academies to support them. Should we be concerned about the fact that the various mean, mediums of replication, those with a history of collusion with the popular arts, those that have come last in the hierarchical ordering of artistic practices, those with the taint of secondariness about them, indeed those with a subtle inferiority complex, or perhaps even a superiority complex, now find a need to organize a union. Is this a progressive or a reactionary move? That is my question for you, and of course the answer is, it depends on how you do it. Perhaps it is unfair to charge curators with having helped to ghettoize prints as a medium. There is a marked satisfaction in belonging to those who love prints and not those who would rather look at the things everybody else looks at. The appeal of it is genuine and infectious. I've experienced it myself and in fact have deployed the argument that institutions should not hold print shows to the same expectations for viewership that more mainstream productions are expected to attain that prints are typically small things and require close attention and otherwise may as well be ignored altogether, and thus that they are mounted with the expectation of a more exclusive audience, a more patient aud audience, even a more informed audience, and therefore an audience that can be expected to gain more from the experience. But a limited number of viewers is not a reason to construct a limited menu of exhibition topics. That should be determined by the interest of the curator and in those historical problems that are most compelling and most accessible through the works available to show. But here, any significant print collection already has in-house a much greater range of historical possibility than is likely to be found in their collections of paintings and sculpture. It is simply a matter of numbers. Therefore, if it is the case that print exhibitions are often dull, it is not the fault of the medium itself, but rather how the medium is interpreted. And I might just say as an aside that um, in the last two days, having spent a bit of time at the Met and also at MoMA, that were I to have that as my sample of what is going on in, in the world of the media and its relationship to everything else, I would have thrown the lecture into the trash. Uh, but I think that what I, I've been looking at is not exemplary. Um, we are now at a crossroads in the museum profession, or should I say, yet another crossroads, one that involves constant fighting for resources, a resistance to lowering the bar on scholarship, and by extension, on what we are able to require of the public. To a lesser extent than the academy, we are under pressure to offer more entertainment, although it would be a mistake to say that the professoriate is not experiencing similar pressures. But there is embedded in these circumstances an appeal that has virtue and that is an encouragement to expand our range of thinking, to cross boundaries, and to be more inclusive. Breaking down the curatorial boxes is only one tactic for doing this, but it may be the most important one. Greenberg's proposition about the integrity to medium did not stand alone. The simultaneous practice of new criticism loomed behind it. New criticism likewise extolled self-referentiality as the objective of modern art, indeed art in general. The impact of these analytical strategies was profound in American higher education from the 50s well into the 70s, and I think it's fair to say that pedagogy in the humanities is still deeply immersed in close reading as a strategy for approaching the significance of a text or a work of art. It is an unsurpassed means of providing students with a vocabulary for looking and was certainly a constant in my own teaching. But in principle, all this 
is meant to be preliminary to establishing an acquaintance with a work of art in order to talk about it in some larger sphere. Material factors have long been a standard basis for curatorial alignments, although its legitimacy as a reflection of historical reality and actual artistic affinity is flimsy at best. Specialization by medium descends primarily from the traditional preferences of collectors to take an interest in particular types of objects, an emotional rather than, a, than an historical factor, and one that seems to have been unusually important for collectors of works on paper. The preferences of collectors is an extremely interesting topic itself and certainly does merit investigation as a problem in the history of taste. But this does not mean uh, make it an ideal model for the organization of things. Special knowledge of a medium is essentially a post hoc rationale for a scheme that was already in place by the 17th century, long before curatorial staffs became necessary components of a museum and art history departments necessary components of a university. In fact, there is no inherent or essential reason why curatorial assignments should adopt this arrangement as their primary model, knowledge of materials and techniques notwithstanding. It is simply one solution out of several. Art historians are trained first in a period and a geographical area, not in a medium. They acquire certain languages and not others as a result of this, and they are expected to understand the history and culture of a time and place whether it be Southern Europe, 19th century England, or Edo, Japan, in, an, in a spectrum of different ways and with considerable thoroughness. In short, we've been taught to be cultural historians with a specialized interest in objects, not the other way around. There's every reason to respect the collector's devotion to a particular medium, whether it be glass, prints, or shoes, each of them represented by museums in one place or another, but the art historian's task in writing about, writing about objects or in taking charge of them as a custodian is to return them to the larger context of their history. The practice of art history should ultimately be one of reintegration, not parceling out. Indeed, the recent developments in professional art history all support not just an integrated approach to the study of objects, but an expanding field of materials and things especially the culture we now loosely refer to as the media. One could reasonably argue that in such a universe, a primary concern of art history should be the defense of its traditional boundaries. What constitutes a work of art? Where should the limits of public collection begin and where should they end? What sorts of things are legitimate topics of study? We must acknowledge that these boundaries have, for evident cultural reasons, become much harder to discern, and the old arguments for doing art history by medium are therefore less persuasive. One thing we can say, however, is that knowledge of the replicated image and its intricate and widely implicated history is a very rich basis for centripetal thinking. When I began writing this essay, I was bent on composing a sermon about the perils of dividing up the history of art according to medium. I still hold to that original position, and for reasons that at least in my understanding have to do with where we are now in our thinking about our, uh, our mutual field of interest. But, I went, but as I went along, I found myself taking, talking more and more about the ways in which prints have, for entirely credible reasons, been granted special status almost since the beginning of the art form. Nonetheless, it seems to me that as the second international organization with serious interest in this subject, you have an enhanced obligation to consider your ambitions widely. We are in an age of cross-disciplinary thinking, and if the discussion of the media, Facebook included, is anything to go by, the replicated visual utterance sits right at the center of it all. This comports with a long-standing disposition in the history of printed matter to be the most sensitive among the arts to respond broadly to its environment, and accordingly the most resistant to Kantian appeals for disinterestedness. The history of the replicated image is one of engagement, not exclusivity. That may sound absurdly grandiose, but what I mean by it is modestly pragmatic. 
Art historians in the academy, at least those concerned with the post-medieval era, now recognize an obligation to take into account the replicated image as a forceful dimension of their field. This is the case not just for Europe, but also for Central and South Asia as well. Meanwhile, down the block, the museums go about, um, uh, meanwhile, in the, in the, uh, down the block, uh, amongst the museums, much is being said about the decreasing authority and effectiveness of curatorial staffs the redistribution of their, their traditional responsibilities and the diminishment of their ranks. The only way to respond to these developments where they occur and they are occurring is to find, uh, is to cross the boundaries of medium and find a common cause with one's fellow art historians, both curators and academics alike, and take back the museum as a place for serious art history. This group could be the perfect forum for helping to further that cause. And in that, I wish you the best. Thank you. Sorry for the somewhat rocky delivery. I had trouble seeing my paper. I think there, people are very short here for some reason. So anyway. <laughs> yeah, sure, of course. We'll take a few questions. Um, if you can make it to the, uh, the microphone in the center aisle, um, this is being recorded, so we'd love to capture uh, what the questions are. Thank you. Ah, there she is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Peter and I have already discussed what I think about the curator and the I can hear you fine. Yeah, there we go. OK. Um, uh, but my question, actually, I would say one thing. Uh, I was sitting next to someone who calls herself a paintings person, just for the record. <laughs> and, um, uh, but my question is, you are the author of a rather traditional book about uh, the medium of printmaking. So I wonder now, and you wrote that some time ago with David Landau. And I was wondering how you see uh, that book now in terms of what you've just been talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair, certainly a fair question. Um, well, first, uh, uh, I, I, I uh, require to uh, be allowed to have my ideas evolve. Not necessarily <laughs> change, though. Not necessarily change. Um, when David and I set out to write that book, um, our intention was precisely to lift the print out in a way that would reintegrate it into the, or actually integrate it into the, in, into the, the full narrative of Renaissance art. Our view was that it had been, been systematically neglected or at least uh, suppressed as far as its uh, central importance to the phenomenon of the Renaissance was concerned. Uh, and it was precisely for that reason that we took a very wide-ranging view of it and focused on case studies and talked a great deal about problems of reception uh, as well as technical issues about how things arose and so forth. We, we saw that book um, precisely as a way of um, attaching it to the larger history, not creating an exclusive story. Um, involving drawings, paintings, and so forth, uh, seriously engaging the issue of color. Uh, meanwhile, there was a coherent kind of story that needed to be told about the Renaissance print broadly in and of itself. And of course, that's also what we did. Um, but the intent was exactly to get it into the, into the story. And I think it did. I think it did. Um, I think. The, the numbers of dissertations and so on that followed in the wake of that book were, were a reflection of the fact that people thought, oh yeah, you know, this is not such a, a great mystery that we can't enter into. And in fact, it's a rather complex and interesting domain and one should do more with it. But it's true, it's a study of prints. Yeah, um, as a lot of what I've done, including my catalogs. And just to, to say one more thing, all the reasons why there should be print curators, I totally agree with. 
<laughs> just to get that on the table. Anyway, but it's not a problem that the Met has or, or ever will have, so I'm not worried about the Met either. Anyway, yes. Uh, thank you for this uh, great uh, provoking uh, lecture. Um, I think one of the ways, the, um, the although it's called Print Scholars Association, one of the ways this uh, association is inclusive already in the way that you suggest we should be is because we we include um, not only print scholars but actually print makers and uh, as you have said uh, the printmaking has evolved to include all kinds of media and combining media and so in in that way through the exchange of printmakers print collectors who maybe not only collect prints anymore uh, it is becoming of in that way, I hope at least. So. Okay. Yeah, it depends on how it evolves, and I think that the uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what kinds of things will happen, but I, my my impression is that um, this is really an organization about um, hosting symposia and lectures and talking, uh, which is you know the absolutely the right way to go about it, uh, and perhaps you know actually subventing things from time to time. Um, one thing about, uh, of course, it's a good idea to involve people who understand how things are made. Uh, I was talking to a colleague of mine who's a museum director recently, and he asked me what I was going to talk about. And I told him, and he said, well, you know, the one thing you can say about uh, print curators, and he's speaking for himself, is that, you know, uh, they can always give you a precise and lucid account of what a dry point is, and uh, you can't expect to find that uh, in 90 percent of the people who curate sculpture. Uh, I don't know. I'm not going to tell you who said that, but uh, uh, there's a funny way in which there's a, the, the in which that's true. In other words, um, our obsession with technique um, has borne fruit, uh, but it also can can be a limitation. I mean, it, it's something that everybody should know more about. That's just you know basic. Um, but beyond that, to kind of depend on it. Uh, so, for example, I, I, I frequently had to wrestle with the Education Department of the National Gallery um, not to put a technical section into my exhibitions when I didn't want one. I don't, I don't have a, a, a blanket objection to that, but um, I dealt with that when I, when I had exhibitions primarily by uh, evolving it through short wall text so that people learned it by looking rather than you know, we're programmed at the beginning. And that's just an example. And I think looking back, for example, on uh, photography criticism, one of the things you would find is that uh, when photography first started to establish its bona fides um, back in the 50s and 60s as a, a, a discipline that could have a kind of critical net uh, behind it, a critical uh, debate behind it, uh, there was uh, heavy dependence on technical issues when you evaluated photography. Their aesthetics were deeply embedded in technical matters. And it, it's exactly that that sort of needs to be gotten over. I mean, one understands that, but it, again, is, is part of centrifugal thinking rather than centripetal thinking. But maybe I misspoke a bit. I should have said artists rather than printmakers because um, I, when I was uh, at the reception uh, a while ago at CAA, I think, mm -hmm. um, of, of the APS, uh, the, the people I talked with, uh, there, there, were, there were artists and they were mostly making monoprints or um, otherwise uh, using techniques that were related to printing, but not per se a replicatable print, so painting over stuff. And so in that way, we already will uh, like expand beyond the traditional printmaking, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and I think this is very evident uh, in um, the, the most current thinking in museums. Uh, and I refer again to what I've seen in the last two days uh, just going on at MoMA and at the Met. Um, the, the media are present everywhere, and I'm talking about, you know, mixtures of things, film and photography and, and printed media, uh, and you know, painting and sculpture and so forth. Um, all all those kinds of boundaries that are defined by curatorial practice uh, are are gone. They're just yeah. not there. And but I also think this is you know this this is a um, this is being led by modernists as it should be. Uh, and and they to me have always been the people that you needed to pay attention to yeah. um, in museums, especially. 
what, what they were doing. And they and modernists, modern, modern departments and museums um, conventionally do not divide themselves up by medium yeah. unless there's a huge critical mass involved. Okay, we can we can talk over whatever is upstairs. Yeah. Again, uh, hope you'll join us upstairs for a, a reception afterwards. Thank you. Thanks. I mean, I... The short, here's the short answer. Okay. The short answer is, you know, it's too great to buy anything in. But they, got, they, you know, they contacted me and played to my band about which is a good way to get to me. And I can all say, scientific committee, had a meeting, yeah. and blah, 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 and what I'm going to say, and a lecture, blah, 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 blah. And I basically said, yeah, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. 
I'm giving this one to the proceeds right now. So I'm sure I will give this away and stay on Oh my goodness. So there's this one giving away. Oh, I'll be around. I'll see you. I'll defend you. I'll show up with a shield. <laughs> Leave me there. I'll break all of my friends. Oh my goodness. I'm really on that I'm going to put you the Yes, of course. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. Um, I was, yeah, I was actually in the thing I was wondering if you were involved in that show. Uh, the one funny thing is that I don't know if you've heard, but it happened on the first day of the show, or like the media afterwards, but the voice sale was closed down for a few days because of the general strategy. So I just found it. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was in a way very, um, yeah, there was a strike, so they couldn't have tried to save the camera So the whole time people didn't know what to do. So you're, of course, going to... I don't know. I don't know much effort to lay it on. I was definitely a sport. It was due to the fact that they were going to... Oh, Yes, exactly. Okay. So, well, people are like, I don't, have to, I don't have to work seven days a week. Are you kidding me? Exactly. But yeah, yeah. so they yeah. I lived in Rome for a while, too. Yeah, the current sort of what the government is pushing for is that uh, they um, you know, take them for that seventh day, traditionally, you know, for, you know, just et cetera, for school groups. Yeah. So it wouldn't be open to the public, but the news is still cool. Oh, cool. Yeah. But they would still have to do that. Yeah. And they say, that's a good to know. I'm glad to get your feedback. And also, to thank you very much. Oh, so. shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.